Of all the secrets on Mist Island, the most mysterious may be why Mist was a hit. When it was released in 1993, Mist was unlike any other game before it. You were tossed into this lackadaisical world without explanation. There were no enemies to fight. You were turning crankshafts to fix broken machinery. You had to read library books with bearded men trapped inside of them. Who the devil are you? And to top it off, there was an unprecedented amount of walking. Yet Mist went on to hold the title of best-selling PC game for a long time until The Sims came along and dethroned it. So why did so many people love it? You might think it was the pretty, compact disc graphics or the grown-up storytelling, but I'm going with the walking. What if moving on foot at a slow pace was Mist's great gift to gaming? Honestly, I'm being serious. I think perambulation is very important to the game design, and if you look closely at the history of Mist's development, you'll see why. The interesting thing about Mist is how clunky home computers serendipitously gave us top-notch walking. When Rand and Robin Miller sat down to make the game, they used an old forgotten programming tool called HyperCard. Similar to what would one day be this very internet, HyperCard was a system where you navigated files by clicking on links. That cards contain both information and interaction. Unlike, say, Skyrim, however, where you have free roam of every precipice and cottage, the world of mist was cobbled together from all of these still images and video footage of places in the game. So walking was really just clicking. This created the illusion of exploring a lush, open environment, even if it was pretty much a PowerPoint presentation. You've got to remember, this was 1993, and the options for exploring 3D games were pretty limited. Mice and keyboards were still esoteric objects, if you could believe it, with only 20% of US households actually owning a computer. But pointing and clicking made strolling to the planetarium easy. Our disk drive, it's really cool. I hear you can even get music on the computer. Oh, hey. Other technical limitations were also great for walking. Mist needed to work on systems with serious memory constraints. They were unable to load a huge island to explore all at once, so the Miller brothers had to chop up the game into different levels. In the same way that Walt Disney designed Disneyland so the castle stood at the center of attractions like Tomorrowland and Frontierland and Main Street, Mist Island was the central hub which hooked up all of Mist's various ages, which could be loaded one at a time. This accidentally did good things for your travels. It meant you could walk at least in any direction without the fear of getting lost because the arrangement of the world was simple to remember. No, no matter what, if I get lost, I can always go back to that central location. Another benefit to all this crappy computer equipment was how walking became contemplative. Because old school CD drives were ridiculously slow, you couldn't just zip through the game. Let me explain for all of you who don't know what it's like to have a 4X CD-ROM drive. If you wanted to move from point A to point B and missed, the laser reading the compact disc had to actually move from point A to point B. So even if you wanted to, you couldn't run through the game because the technology literally wasn't fast enough. You had to walk. This also means that the game's assets actually had to be encoded on the CD in an arrangement that corresponded to your path through the game. It was the only way the laser was quick enough to read the data without a long delay. But even then, turning to the left or to the right could be a bit sluggish. But in retrospect, this was a positive. Going slow has this lovely benefit of experiencing a space. As Nietzsche said, never trust the thought that didn't come by walking, which is good advice when mulling over how to solve that stupid gear puzzle. So maybe that's why Mist was so huge and important. It shows us that game design doesn't only apply to things like awesome combat and strategy and difficult puzzles, it extends to every facet of the game, even to something as pedestrian as walking. Walking simulators, but here I think we've found a, like a literal one. So the next time you dismiss a game like Everybody's Gone to the Rapture as a walking simulator, think about all the design choices that went into it. Then be thankful your computer isn't a 1990s era PC because then it would be way slower. The perfect computer should be exactly what you want it to be. So what do you think? Was missed a breakthrough in the mechanic of walking or is it just geriatric? Hash it out in the comments and if you like what you saw, please subscribe. I'll see you next week. Last week we talked about how real, or I guess not real, virtual pets actually are. Let's see what you had to say. Inspirational Doge memes takes issue with the idea that virtual pets actually convey emotion at all. He says that they just mimic it. And to explain, he brings up the example of the Chinese room. No, not the game development studio, but a thought experiment that was performed by, or a thought experiment that was created by Berkeley psychology professor John Searle. So say you have this person who's over here who uh, doesn't know Chinese and they're in this room, hence the Chinese room. And another person over here is 
is asking this person questions in Chinese. So this guy in the room also possesses a set of magical translation tools that allow him to go through the process of deciphering the questions that are being asked by the person over here and then responding in fluent Chinese. So the person who's asking uh, this other person the question thinks that the person on the other side of the wall actually knows Chinese, but in reality, this poor, uh, you know, poor person has no knowledge of Chinese whatsoever. So what Doge Memes is saying is that it's basically just an elaborate set of pulleys and levers um, that give the illusion of emotion, and then we project our own emotions, it's called transference, on top of it, um, which is also something that we do with real pets. And in fact, Johansson at uh, It's Okay to Be Smart um, actually did an episode about what dogs are thinking that we'll link to in the description. So this only proves this larger question that this thing that we're asking our interactions with, you know, the dog from Call of Duty, for example, or a Furby, this is part of a larger conversation about how, uh, how much real or inanimate, inanimate objects actually have uh, real emotions and how they convey those to us or whether we're just sort of making the whole thing up. But yeah, great, great observation. Asani Place says that the phenomenon where we develop feelings for non-sentient things not only occurs with virtual pets, but to all kinds of objects, such as stuffed animals. And this is 100% correct. Uh, one of my favorite ever internet thought experiments, uh, I guess it was an actual experiment, was performed by Rob Walker and Joshua Glenn. It was called Significant Objects. I'll link to it in the description. Essentially, they gathered, they gathered worthless trinkets that they got um, garage sales and uh, yard sales, and then they gave them out to authors to write little short stories about them. And what they found was that after these worthless objects became part of a narrative, the emotional energy of these inanimate objects increased tremendously, so much so that people paid way more money than they were actually worth. So in the same vein, when we train and feed virtual pets or have a dinosaur, uh, a dinosaur stuffed animal that we've carried around since grade school, they become part of the narrative of our lives. And in that sense, they become emotionally significant to us, even though they may not have actual real world value. But great point, Kasani.